Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be listening to the third part of what if Deku was in villain class 1A. If you enjoy, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing down below and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you get notified when videos go live. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Chapter 9, Are you sure we should do this? What, the class erupted? Some stood up, others just sat there and gaped. Some grinned stupidly at the idea, others just had their mouth hanging open in utter disbelief that they'd really just heard Midoriya say such a thing. But as far as he could tell, a majority of the class was giddy with their excitement. Had Midoriya really just suggested that they should break out of UA? Was that even possible? How could they do it? Where would they go afterwards? Would they be able to avoid capture? Could they sustain themselves outside of UA? What if they... All these questions were thrown at Midoriya from all directions with an intensity comparable to a tennis ball launcher on the fritz. Everybody stop, that, surprisingly, was Aitza, at such an unexpected volume that everyone did calm down and listen to him. He turned back to Midoriya, we cannot do such a thing. Well, why not? Midoriya replied unsurely. He stared at him, because we can't. We can't exactly be vigilantes here, Aitza, Kaminari pointed out. We cannot leave Yue. Aitza insisted, standing up and gawking at them all. Can you not fathom the trouble you'd bring if you were caught? This was true, and painfully so. It ripped the excited smiles from the faces of Class A. But Midoriya was on it. From Yeyoroz's drawer, he'd retrieved a scarcely used, black whiteboard pen. He drew a line down the middle of the board, as high up as he could reach, separating the stupid nicknames that had been there since the beginning of term, from the blank other half. When you decide that you might want to do something, before you even think up a plan, you have to do two things, he started. On the board he wrote. The best case scenario. The worst case scenario. Best case is that we get out and become awesome vigilantes. Mina exclaimed, fully into this idea. Midoriya wrote that down word for word. Worst case is that we are captured, and failed, Aitza snapped. Midoriya wrote that down too hesitated, and then wiped off the last two words. Think about it, he said, taking a step back from the board and staring at the smudge marks were and failed had been. There are two points in time that this could go downhill. The worst case scenario, we are captured. Before we are able to leave UA. Sometime afterwards. Let's look at option one, Midoriya nodded, turning back to the class. Imagine our escape plan fell through, and UA brought us back here, can you seriously imagine Mr. Izawa failing all of us? Aitza, who seemed to represent the opposing argument here, narrowed his eyes, hmm. I suppose Yue's reputation could be on the line. Exactly, said Midoriya, pointing his pen at him. Imagine trying to tell the public that all of Class A was failed, including the likes of you and Shoto, just because we all worked together as a team to try and escape the place that was essentially holding us prisoner. It doesn't make any sense. Before we are able to leave UA, and things go back to normal with added security. I, realistically can't see them being able to do worse than that. Midoriya exclaimed, dropping his arms to his sides with a huff. Aitza seemed unconvinced, unless they failed only a small number of us as an example to the rest. Midoriya bit his lip, that was a good point. Not if we all stand up for one another. There are certain people they cannot expel especially the more high profile of us because it would draw too much public attention. But if we all play an equal role in this, they can't pick out an example, and if they do, they'll struggle to justify it. UA has to give a report to the police and press as to why someone is failed. What's going on inside Class A is big news, it might not feel like it because we're on the inside, but for everyone outside, they want to know more and more about our individual stories and who we are and stuff, especially with the sports festival coming up. Imagine the backlash if they expelled one of us for something stupid like trying to run away. They just can't do that. But what about the second option, croaked Sue? Aitza nodded, once we have been gone for any significant period of time, we will lose the protection UA provides. Capture would mean immediate imprisonment. He hesitated, no, not if we play the game right. What game? Aitza almost hissed. I've done plenty of research into this topic before I came here, Midoriya admitted, crossing his arms. There are certain ways, loopholes in laws, that can seriously dampen punishments on vigilantes. 
Wait, seriously. Carries him a frown. What kind of loopholes? Well, for one, there is a very fine line between vigilantism and self-defense, Midoriya grinned. If your opponent strikes first, then you can argue you weren't playing hero, you were just defending yourself. That's not illegal. And there are tons of little bypasses like that. They're there for a reason. The very first heroes were selected from a large group of active vigilantes, back when quirks started appearing. And when reforming the laws to accommodate them, some official on the inside must have felt sorry for these hundreds of vigilantes who are about to be arrested, their identities exposed, lives ruined. And the loopholes were left purposely for the smartest to evade the system. In time, a lot of them were given licenses too, just to cover up the problems the laws left. But those problems still exist, you just need to know where to look. But there are some problems we can't avoid, Aitza argued. Resisting arrest, trespassing, the list goes on. True, he nodded with a sigh, but the weight isn't nearly as much as it could have been. Time is also an important factor, the longer we can go without capture, the more the public knows of us, the more respect we earn. Then, when we're caught, we have a large group of people backing us up. So, the worst case is being caught really early, Eurica realized. Yes, but despite all that, no matter how long it's been, UA will still be held responsible for our actions. Upon capturing all of us, seeing we had heroic intent will give them good reason to simply take us back to Class A. That's the best way of maintaining their good reputation. Midoriya turned back to the whiteboard, rubbing off most of the writing with his sleeve, so, in conclusion, the worst case scenario is. The worst case scenario, we are captured and end up back at UA. He looked to Aitza, waiting for a response. His friend simply sighed, okay, I agree. Midoriya wasn't the only one who grinned. Or we could die as a vigilante, Hagakure pointed out. Midoriya actually scoffed, surprisingly himself with his own sarcasm as he replied, in the span of less than a month at UA I have nearly drowned twice, nearly been crushed by a giant purple monster, nearly been disintegrated and actually shot. To be perfectly honest, being a vigilante won't be any more dangerous to me than walking in a straight line. You're just a trouble magnet, Midoriya, said Tsu blatantly. This is all well and good, but it injiro, but how do we actually get out of UA? Okay, Midoriya nodded. He turned to the whiteboard and rubbed away his writing. Now that we've established that the best case scenario outweighs the worst case scenario, we need to look at actually making a plan. And the first step in that, is identifying what's in our way. What prevents us getting out of UA? Mina raised her hand, the tracking anklets. Midoriya nodded and wrote it down. The cameras around school, Yeyorozu pointed out. Everyone pitched in, and soon they had a list of the obstacles that they faced. Tracking anklets. Cameras. Hero patrols. Doors being locked at night. The walls around UA. Teachers being able to read the messages on the phones. Right, and now we need to figure out how to get past all this, said Midoriya, taking a few steps back and narrowing his eyes at the list, tapping the end of the pen against his lips. I think the phones are quite a big problem. Not really, Ajiro contradicted, can't we just not use them? Leave them behind. Well, Midoriya sighed, a communication device for us all is really useful. Moreover, there's a chance that these phones can be tracked too. I can try to take them apart and try to undo all the systems that UA put in them, but the moment I do that, they might know what I'm up to. I have an idea. Eureka suddenly cried, jumping to her feet. Hold that thought, and she charged out of the room and up the stairs. Everyone just blinked at the spot she'd disappeared from for a moment. The, doors being locked isn't much of a problem, Hagakure announced eventually. We can just go out windows or pick the lock. I can always make a copy of Mr. Izawa's key if you could get it for me for a minute or so, Yeyorozu offered. Yeah. That would be great. As Midoriya crossed the door problem off the list, Yurika reappeared, face flustered from running, and she handed Midoriya her phone. Wait, not her phone. There was a bold number 19 across the back. Is this Mineta's phone? Midoriya exclaimed. Everyone gaped at her as she rubbed her head sheepishly, I might have taken it back when you were pranking Miss Midnight and we lowered him out the window. I honestly completely forgot about it until now. B but you could tinker with this phone. The teachers wouldn't know, they're not looking for it and won't see something's amiss. 
that's such a good idea, Okako. Mina exclaimed. I swear to God, you're such a wolf in sheep's clothing. She blushed and did a little curtsy. This is perfect. Midoriya beamed. I if I can figure out how to fix this phone, then before we escape, I can do the same with everyone else's. As quick as I can so it's not suspicious. Of course, if there's any kind of warning system installed or tracker, it might be risky and could alert them as to what we're doing. Why don't I make new communication devices? Yayo Rosa suggested. I can make radio earpieces quite easily. Hmm, I don't know, it's a good idea. Don't get me wrong. But radio would be way too easy to tap into, we can use it as a backup plan though. She stood up and took Mineta's stolen phone off Midoriya. After rolling it over in her hands for a moment, frowning, she said, Well, if you can take this apart, I could make copies of all the parts and we could make replica phones. Midoriya gaped, You can really do that. I can try. Mina bounded over, took the pen off Midoriya and crossed the phone problem off with one, neat, sweeping line. Check, she grinned. I don't think the walls are much of an issue if we can outtweet the tracking anklets and the security cameras, Aitza acknowledged, sitting in a thinking pose as he stared at the board. I'll just freaking blow them up. Kaken yelled. Or I could float over them, added Eureka. We might have to split up into smaller groups and meet up again on the other side, Midoriya realized. For example, if Kaken blew up a portion of the wall on one side of the campus, whilst Sato breaks down another section far away, the hero's attention would be divided, and we have more of a chance of getting away. Mina crossed out the wall on the list, check. What are we going to do about the anklets though, Ribbit, asked Sue. That seems like the biggest problem. Yes. Tell us, Sunza. Eureka exclaimed. You don't even remember who that is, do you, Ribbit? Nope. It's really not that big of a problem. Midoriya sat down next to her and pulled up the bottom of his right trouser leg, ignoring Eureka's interjection, I have the most basic model of the tracker, because I don't have a quirk to try and break it with. But if you look at, air, Shotos. He nodded, knelt down, and revealed the tracker. See? It's not the same, Shoto's is made of a different material, and it's thicker too. That shows that they couldn't give Shoto the basic design, because he could break it with his quirk, maybe shatter it with ice or burn through it with fire. His is more temperature resistant. That means, Shoto could break mine off easily. And then Mina. She put her foot forwards and hiked up her trouser leg too. Her tracker was even bulky, and of a different material too. Mina's needs to be resistant to her acid. Clearly what Shoto has wouldn't be good enough to withstand her quirk, meaning Mina could undo his tracker, and potentially, he could undo hers. Huh, that's a pretty cool idea, said Kaminari. B but what if I accidentally get my acid on someone? Mina suddenly exclaimed, clearly incredibly nervous about the prospect. But you've gotten so much better at your quirk. Hagakure pointed out. And don't lie to me. I know you've been hiding your progress from the teachers because you don't want to graduate yet. Wait, seriously. Siro frowned. Mina, why would you do that? Eureka inhaled. I I, she wavered. Class C just seemed so boring. I don't have that much control, I'm only a little better. But. I just didn't want to risk graduating so fast, I like being with you guys. Midoriya knew she didn't want the matter being pushed any further, it's okay. He insisted, we'll only use your quirk as a last resort to get someone's anklet off. She nodded, handing the pen back to Midoriya and sitting down beside Hagakure, hugging a pillow. Midoriya was the one who crossed off that point on the list. All that remained were hero patrols and the matter of the cameras. Okay, he nodded to himself, this is where it gets a little more serious. He turned back to the class. For the cameras, we need to try and turn as much of the system off as possible. As soon as we do this, it's going to ring alarm bells for the heroes, so they'll rush to fix the problem. My idea is, like in the classroom when you were pranking Miss Midnight, is for Kaminari to short circuit a fuse box to cause a blackout. But which fuse box, asked Kiri's Hima. That's the problem. We could take out our fuse box, no problem, but that would only disable the cameras near the dorms, which isn't enough. The best thing to do is to either find a way to cut the power for the entire school, or shut off the receiver of all the camera feeds. 
to figure out which is the best option, we need to actually take a look at them. The Hero Patrols faces a similar dilemma. I think the information would be stored somewhere in the staff room, so someone needs to sneak in, write down that information, and get out without being caught. So, basically, grinned Hagakure, probably, it sounded like she was grinning, we need to make super cool action teams to get the information. Air, yeah, I guess, Midoriya agreed. He rubbed the board clear again, okay, so this is what the different groups need to achieve. Find. You can't just number the teams. Mina suddenly called out. Why not? Midoriya frowned. Because that's confusing. Like, Aoyama is number one. Um. I guess so. So, just team A and. Ew, gross, I don't want to be in team B, Jiro interrupted. Mina inhaled sharply, color code them. Rainbow order. Yurika exclaimed, punching the air. Midoriya was just confused. Why are the teams rainbow ordered? Rainbow order. Mina insisted, slamming her fists onto the coffee table in front of her and wincing when she hurt her hands. Everyone raise your hands for rainbow order. Yurika announced, thrusting hers in the air. The teams were rainbow ordered. Red find the hero's patrol timetable. Yellow find the best place to disable the camera slash shut off the power. Green fix the phone problem. Blue wander around the grounds and find the best places to break down the wall slash escape from. Purple distractions. I bagsy team purple. Mina yelled, raising her hand into the air. Let Midoriya assign the teams. Aitsa shouted back at her. On every team we need at least one lookout, Midoriya continued, ignoring the chaos around him. Except for team purple. We'll set up some code words and responses to text to each other, and Purple's job is to run around and cover for the other teams if something goes wrong. After far more discussion than necessary, mainly about disliking the assigned colors of the groups they found themselves in, the teams were finally put together. Red Hagakure and Aitsa. Yellow Yurika, Kaminari, Sato and Shoji. Green Midoriya, Yeyorozu and Shoto. Blue Kaken Bakugo Kaken, Kiris Hima, Jiro and Tokoyami. Purple Mina, Siro, Koda, Ajiro, Aoyama and Tsu. The escape was planned to go ahead on Monday evening. That left them Saturday and Sunday to complete their various tasks. Midoriya grinned, this was going to be interesting. The story of Team Red. Aitsa had found himself in a difficult position. His life changed the moment his older brother, Tensei, was hurt. He was found in a dark alleyway, cold and alone, paralyzed from the waist down. The doctors say that if he were left much longer, he would never have made it. Aitsa remembered running through the corridors of the hero hospital, footsteps echoing around him. He fell to Tensei's bedside and sobbed. The hero in Genium, was no more. It had been a famed villain that had done the deed, a maniac who believed that heroes were nothing but fakes, in it for the money, they didn't deserve the title. He'd taken it upon himself, to dispose of these fake heroes. And of all people, that meant his brother. The kindness, most wonderful hero Aitsa had ever met. And Aitsa remembers the blinding hatred, the face of the man that ruined his brother's life. The hero killer, Stain, decided to leave Tensei alive, to spread the message. But Tinya was another story. Stain was going to kill him, but they were caught. A hero appeared and called for backup immediately. Stain knew better than to risk staying behind and finishing the job. He fled, like a coward leaving Aitsa behind with permanent damage to the nerves in his arm and hand. And worse, a criminal record as a vigilante, resulting in a ticket to UA, to the wrong class. But some time had passed since the incident now, and Aitsa was determined to transfer to class B and make his brother proud. He'd swallowed his concerns of his villainous classmates and done his absolute best to get along. Then he learned of the system surrounding class president, and went right down to business, determined for the role. He organized the class, enforced Mr. Izawa's orders, he did everything he could. Only, he couldn't control them. None of Class A listened to him, no matter how loudly he shouted. But they did listen, to of all people, Midoriya. At the beginning of term, Midoriya was the first person that Aitsa really connected with. Aitsa learned a few things about him right off the bat. He was small, weak, quirkless, and timid. His life had clearly been very tough up until this point, and Aitsa decided that, in a class of juvenile delinquents, 
Midoriya needed protecting. And Aizu was wrong. As time went by, Midoriya changed. Or, perhaps, he just became more confident, his meek exterior melting away. He grew bitter. It soon became clear to Aizu, that out of the entire class, it was really Midoriya that the heroes should have been watching, he was the real danger. And he didn't need a quirk to do that. And so, Aizu had found himself in a difficult position. Because Midoriya, the one he had underestimated, was now in total control, and no one else seemed to notice. The idea of fleeing Yue was his, and everyone was eager to follow him. Now, Aizu wanted to be a hero. He wanted to do all the things that Midoriya had talked about, making a difference and helping people. And he did know that his decisions in life had limited his options, he wouldn't be as great as Tensei, nor as trusted. He doomed himself from the moment he stood up to Stain. Midoriya offered him, and everyone else, an escape. It wasn't like Mr. Aizawa, who had been in class A and made it out, only not with the life he perhaps could have had. No, Midoriya was different, because he really was one of them. He was in their position too, and worse, perhaps, being without a quirk. But he smiled and held out his hand to them, giving them all an opportunity to be better. Vigilantes, real vigilantes, not just petty criminals that had been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and had tried to do the right thing, like a lot of Aitz's classmates. They would be heroes on the wrong side of the law. The idea was so wonderful, and everyone was so desperate for a life like that, that they all seemed to agree with limited hesitation. The way Midoriya put it, there were no downsides to attempting this feat. But Aitza could still see them. He knew that if they were caught, and they were bound to be at some point, whether it be in a few days or a few years, they would be even more doomed than they were already. Currently, Aitza was seen as a heartbroken young boy with a heroic family and thus, heroic potential, who had acted rashly and recklessly, unaware of the consequences. There was a way out, a way to fix this up at least a little bit. But as soon as Aitza joined the rest of class A to escape, he'd be seen as a real problem, more villainous than heroic. If they were caught, Aitza's life would be even harder than it was seeming to be already. So, why was he still going through with this? Aitza was put in Team Red. If there was a meaning behind the color choice, Aitza didn't know it. It was their job to uncover the routes and times that heroes patrolled the school. He talked it over with Hagakure, an expert in stealth and well, thievery. They had two days to complete the task, three if they were to include Monday morning. For Team Red, they needed to get into the staff room, which would be a bad idea on Sunday, when there were no lessons and more teachers were bound to be in there. That meant Saturday was their best option. And by extension, Saturday afternoon. Team Blue said they wouldn't be doing anything until Sunday. Team Green had an ongoing project that they could only continue with when they were at the dorms, and Team Yellow decided to spread their tasks over the two days. When discussing this, it was Tsu who pointed out that they had an English lesson on Saturday afternoon, which was held by present Mike. Aitza did try his hardest to get as much work done as possible, but the lesson lasted roughly five minutes. Team Purple remained to run amok, Team Yellow disappeared to check the school's roof for fuse boxes, and whilst the rest of the class decided to stay in the classroom and act as though nothing was wrong. Aitza swallowed his pride, got up, and followed Hagakure out into the corridor. She changed in the girls' toilets, and reappeared as nothing but a floating anklet, which was easy to miss. Aitza, meanwhile, had waited outside Class A. When she tapped him on the shoulder, they both made their way to the staff room. In this time, Aitza was deep in thought. He could stop this before it went too far, tell a teacher. Alternatively, he could sit the entire ordeal out, let the others flee without him. But, the class needed supervision. Midoriya had control, yes, but he was just as swept up and excited about the concept as everyone else. He needed grounding, and that's where Aitza believed he came into the picture. Moreover, if, by some miracle, they did succeed in becoming a team of vigilantes, they needed someone who could set some clear boundaries, and keep an eye on them, stop them if something went wrong. Aitza was one of the only ones who had doubts, who could see both sides of the argument clearly and maintain the balance between, well, good and evil. Yes, a difficult position indeed. Look straight ahead, I'm not here, Hagakure whispered. There are cameras everywhere and we couldn't risk taking this stupid anklet off me before Monday, she muttered bitterly. It's so annoying. I'm nowhere near as stealthy with this ridiculous thing on. 
Aitza didn't risk replying, not that he'd know what to say anyway. They approached the staff room door. Just knock and open right away to let me in, Hagakure insisted. Hold out as long as you can. You need to have the attention of everyone in the staff room until I tap you on the shoulder and we can go. Aitza nodded stiffly and raised his hand to knock. It swung open before he made contact, oh, hello, Aitza, said Miss Midnight. Aitza's shoulders tensed at the mention of his name. Of course, Midnight knew his brother well, which was likely why she failed to remember to refer to him by his student number. She was standing right in the doorway, Hagakure wouldn't be able to slip past. Aitza nervously stepped to the side, gesturing Midnight to walk out, which she did, are you looking for someone? Midnight asked. Aitza felt Hagakure leave his side and hurry into the staff room. He cleared his throat, why yes. I hope to find present Mike. Is he here? Hmm, let me check. She turned and walked back into the room and Aitza followed. He tried to stop his eyes from darting around the room in search of Hagakure. Mike, did you seriously abandon your class again? Midnight scoffed. There were only a few teachers in the room. That being Midnight, present Mike, the hero Aitza didn't recognize, and a skeletal looking stranger in clothes far too big for his figure. All their eyes were now fixed on Aitza and present Mike, meaning Hagakure could continue her mission in peace. Present Mike stood up, his glasses slightly askew. This is the worst class that Shota's had yet. Well, he did tell you not to try them on the first day of term, Midnight sighed. I didn't try them. I had one conversation with Midoriya and suddenly the entire class knows I hate bugs and now they're everywhere, he grabbed Midnight's shoulders. They watch me, they're in my hair, in my clothes in my food. Midnight brushed his hands away, the class or the bugs. The bugs, and he screamed for extra effect. It even made a pile of paper scatter across the floor on the other side of the room, or maybe that was Hagaku's doing. It drew their gaze, and Aitza knew this was the time to remind them of his presence. He cleared his throat again, I do apologize for their actions, sir. I I didn't realize you were here. Present Mike exclaimed. He pointed dramatically in his direction, it's one of the only tolerable members of class A, yeah yeah uh -huh. Aitza waited until he was done shouting. Why yes, thank you. I was wondering if you could come back to. He won't be coming back, Midnight grinned. She picked up a small carrier bag that Aitza was quite sure she'd been holding when she tried to leave the staff room before he arrived. Very honorable of you to try though. Where are you going? Present Mike yelled. To have lunch somewhere a little quieter. And she disappeared without another word. So, would you return to our English? There were spiders in my hair. He screamed again at the very thought. Aitza fought the urge to cover his ears, yes, sorry again. I shall have a very stern word with them all on your behalf. Are you class president, that was the skeletal man speaking. Ah, no, that position has not been decided upon quite yet, Aitza admitted, feeling rather proud that he'd assumed as such. Right, I didn't notice that you don't have the bands. Similarly to how all of class A wore red bands on the arms of their blazers, class presidents from any department sported a slimmer, gold variant, to distinguish them from their classmates. Vice presidents wore silver. Aitza was not sure how this would combine with the red marks of class A. Perhaps they would overlap, or maybe border one another. If you don't mind me asking, sir, what do you teach? Aitza asked the stranger, who visibly stiffened at the query. I don't recall seeing you before. I, air. Well, to tell you the truth, young man. I'm, here for the heroics department, yes. T the sports festival will be here soon, and I am to help organize. Ah, forgive my curiosity. It's fine. What is your name? So that I may refer to you correctly in the future. Air. Mr. Yagi. A pleasure to make your acquaintance, Mr. Yagi, sir. This was the moment that Aitza's phone beeped from his pocket. He pulled it out to investigate. Class A group chat. Okako Eurika, 5 what homework is due on Monday? Ah, that was her group signal that something was going wrong. Right, right, very nice, present Mike interjected, running his hands through his gelled hair nervously. Why don't you go back to class and make sure the rest of them get their homework at least? It's on the tea table, I'll put in a good word to Aizawa for yet. Aitza hesitated, Hagakure wasn't done with her search yet. 
he glanced back down at his phone. Mina Ashido, too don't worry. We'll help. And moments later, there was a long bang that shook the very building. Everyone in the staff room froze, likely, Hagakure did too. What was that? Present Mike exclaimed. Sensing this was something to do with his class, Aitsa stepped in front of the door to stop anyone from leaving, ah, likely at fault of the support course. It usually is, nodded Mr. Yagi, which Aitsa was relieved about. It sounded a lot closer, Present Mike realized. Maybe I should check. Here, Mr. Present Mike, sir, I... Hey there. Are you trying to stop me from leaving? No, not at all. I just thought that, maybe you needed to, talk about your phobia of bugs. Huh. Yes. Fears are tricky things, and as Midoriya implied, great weaknesses. Perhaps if you spoke about, and actively exercised your entomophobia, such weaknesses could be resolved. Moreover, your problems with class A would be no longer an issue for you. Present Mike blinked at him for a moment, before resting his hands on Aitza's shoulders, the hero's glasses falling a little way down his nose. Wow, air, thank you, little listener. People don't usually stop and think about these things and, well, your class has been so difficult recently, but they're not the only ones who exploit it. Midnight, Aizawa, my friends, they take advantage and they laugh. They laugh. Well, Shota doesn't laugh, I don't think he knows how. But anyway it means a lot for a member of class A, of all classes, am I right? To speak to me so sincerely. Because people just don't take me seriously, but I can be serious. I can be a serious guy. I just don't like bugs. And I mean, who does? They're creepy and... Aitza was painstakingly aware that, across the room, leaning up against a pinboard, a pen was moving seemingly all on its own, jotting something down on a sticky note. They're out for me. It's like all the bugs in the world got together one night to plan their attack, I attract them. It's not fair. The sticky note floated across the room like it had simply fallen off the board. Aitza would have thought that to be the truth if it didn't jump up behind him and slide into his pocket. They do, they do. They play games with my phobia. That's serious, villainous, cruel. Hagakure poked the back of his shoulder. Never understand how I feel and... Yes, definitely, I completely agree Aitza backed away, feeling for the doorknob and being careful not to walk into Hagakure. The door opened for him, yes and I'll get back to my class now, bye, and he shut the door in his teacher's face. Aitza breathed a sigh of relief. He turned and marched back down the corridor towards class A, nodding when Hagakure informed him that she'd hurry back to the bathrooms for a while, and that she'd meet him back in the classroom. He was very thankful for that to be over. But he did feel guilty for his actions. He was, betraying the heroes. However, he was doing it for his friends. He would protect them through whatever endeavors they pursue. He hadn't really had friends before. With a slight smile, he pulled open the door to class A. That smile faded immediately. The story of Team Purple. Tsu wasn't too sure why she'd found herself in the distraction team. Perhaps it was because Midoriya trusted her to keep them the slightest bit under control. Not that it mattered, because Midoriya was present in English when their moment to shine revealed itself, and Tsu had nothing to do with it. Present Mike knew something was up the moment he stepped foot into the classroom that afternoon, after injured Mr. Izawa hobbled away, ducking his head from present Mick's swinging arms when he burst inside. A few minutes passed with knowing glances exchanged between them. Their first task was to remove present Mike from the equation. They talked about it the night before, and quiet, timid Koda, had for the first time, decided to make his mark. Tsu had always wondered why Koda was in class A. He may have had a frightening, brutish exterior, but he was actually very unsure of himself and shy, confining in animals rather than people, and Tsu could see the appeal. Moreover, he could talk to them, the animals, that is, they followed his orders, that was his quirk. Tsu somehow wasn't that surprised when she learned that, following several break-ins to kennels for stray dogs across the city, the release of a mistreated circus lion resulted in said lion finding a home in a well-renowned zoo, and Koda in UA's Class 1A. Sometimes Tsu felt like she was in a zoo. People always gawked at her. They always had, she supposed. She had a natural hunch, a tongue that filled most of her mouth and resulted in a croaky, strange-sounding voice, and wide, curious eyes. 
she didn't really have many friends before Yue, just Habuko, who started off the same as all the others, staring. And then of course Yue happened. Tsu had never found more acceptance than in a class that no one else could accept. Sure, everyone was a little terrifying. Okako was a thief for hire with plenty of stories to tell, and she was almost as good at martial arts as Ajiro, a vigilante. Then Tsu's other closest friend, Midoriya, may seem meek at first, but he had a leashed fury inside of him, and the mind to do something with it. Walking around with these people definitely made people stare. But. Tsu didn't mind much anymore. Present Mike screamed and Kyoka clutched her hands over her sensitive ears. There was a spider in his hair. Kota had spent the morning befriending all that they could find around the dorm, which was far more than Tsu had expected. Their teacher, still screaming, fell off his chair at the sight of dozens of little spiders crawling their way across the table. And with one still dangling from the end of his gelled up hair by an invisible thread, he raced out of the classroom and slammed the door shut behind him. After a moment of stunned silence, they all burst into laughter. Not long after, two groups deemed it safe to leave, which were Okako's and Aitsa's teams. Okako seemed quite eager, Aitsa, not so much. Tsu wondered what he was thinking about. Tsu felt unsure now. Being numbers 4 and 5, Aitsa and Okako usually sat behind Tsu, number 3, in class. She felt strangely alone without them. This is why she got up, hopped to the other side of the classroom, and sat down in Mineta's old seat, behind Midoriya. Oh oh, hi, he replied nervously as Tsu arrived. What are you doing? Just, stuff. He was drawing in his notebook. Tsu could just see it over his shoulder. He was an exceptionally good drawer, but he seemed very self-conscious about it. What kind of stuff, Ribbit? Tsu would have liked to say there was not much point in continuing this narrative. This is because both team's tasks were completed with no trouble, and no distractions were needed after all. For the rest of the disrupted English lesson, Tsu simply looked through Midoriya's notebook with him, and in exchange for the kind gesture of letting her take a peek, she informed him of the weaknesses she could think of to do with her quirk. Only the last part was actually true, because far sooner than expected, the brick phones around Class A all beeped simultaneously. Class 1 a group chat. Okako what homework is due on Monday? Wait, does that mean she's in trouble? Questioned Siro. Someone must be going up to the roof, Midoriya realized with a frown. Mina gasped loudly, clapping her hands, does this mean we need a distraction? Mina don't worry. We'll help. Sounds like it. Ribbit, Tsu nodded. But what do we do? To get them away from the roof we need to either go up there to stop them or make, air, a big noise to draw them back down. K can blow something up. Shut the hell up. Bakugo yelled, and stop calling me that. Maybe that's not such a good idea. Midoriya interjected, referring to the blowing up suggestion. Boo. Mina yelled. Aitz is not here. You're not allowed to tell us off. You're supposed to help us plan stupid things. Midoriya blinked at her, I am. Ignoring him completely, Mina stood up on her chair and addressed the rest of them as though this were an important announcement, we must irritate Kikin until he explodes. That'll take too long. Siro contradicted. We don't have Kaminari. Tsu decided just to watch this ordeal unfold. Then who else is here that can blow something up and isn't as much of a chicken as Kikin? I'm not chicken, he barked. I'm just not freaking stupid enough to blow a hole in the wall. This was when Aoyama stood up on his chair beside Mina and bowed deeply and melodramatically. Allow Moi to be of assistance. Without further warning required, everyone scrambled to their feet and out of the way. Now on his table, Aoyama rested his hands behind his head and with a wink in Tsu's direction, sent a massive, sparkling laser from the mirrored belt he wore around his navel. This is why there's now a large hole in their classroom. The story of Team Yellow. Eureka was excited. Gosh, it had been so long since she'd prepared for a mission like this. And this was unlike any other, this was one of the first times that she didn't have that cloud of guilt hanging over her. The thrill without heavy feelings weighing her down as the villain Zero, Eureka really could fly. She was practically bouncing on her tippy toes as lunch came to an end. Present Mike soon fled their English lesson, a frequent occurrence, and Eureka and her team were off. She was in charge, she was in charge, as per Midori's instruction. Their objective, find the best place to short out the building to take out the security cameras, 
something Eureka may or may not have attempted before, not at UA though, of course. There were bound to be plenty of places all over the school that could do this, but could they take out all the cameras? Probably not. That's why, last night, Eureka concluded that the best thing to do was to take out, not the cameras, but the connection to the cameras. Where all the feeds were wirelessly brought together and likely displayed on some kind of computer screen, okay, maybe Midoriya had helped her with that idea. That would probably be in Principal Nizu's office, which was on the very top floor of the main building. Take out the power for the main building, and the rest of the school's security would also be obsolete. So, where was the best bet for that? The roof, of course. And that was where they were going. Siro had been up there before, but he wasn't on Eureka's team, so he told them everything he knew about getting up there. Eureka didn't even need to waste time picking the lock, because the door to the roof didn't even have a latch. Who did Eureka have with her? Well, there was Kaminari, who was a bit of a disastrous flirt with everyone, but he was still fun. He was the one who needed to take out the power, so he needed to see what they'd be targeting. Then, there was Sato. He acted all tough, but he was really a big sweetheart. He loved to cook and often taught Eureka a few tricks and shortcuts. Sato's strength quirk activated when he ate sugar, which was why he was carrying sugar cubes in his pockets, only the stronger he got, the more his mental capacity suffered. That was why he was at UA, a few too many dangerous, accidental outbursts. But he didn't need his quirk to be strong, his natural muscles were good enough for what they needed, which was to rip the covers off any fuse box they needed to investigate, if the locks proved too tricky for Eureka. Finally, she had Shoji. He was their lookout. His quirk made him look kind of creepy, but it was still so useful. His six arms were webbed together, and from there, he could grow even more. Like hands, mouths, ears, eyes, super cool. He also wore a mask and often spoke out of fake mouths rather than his real one, Eureka reckoned he was self-conscious. See. So many of her classmates acted like big bad villains, but really, they were normal kids with tricky lives, just like her. It's quite nice up here, Eureka sighed when they reached the roof, feeling the breeze in her hair. She'd instinctively glanced around for security cameras but couldn't see any. Yeah. Kaminari grinned, maybe we should have lunch up here sometime. That would be so cool. You guys down for that? She asked the other two. I eat at the dorms, Shoji replied simply. Maybe it was because of his mask. Maybe just one time. Eureka asked, hands clasped, smile wide and eyes sparkling. Shoji just looked at her for a moment, fine. Yay. So, what are we looking for? Sato questioned, getting right down to it. Hmm, a big box. Or maybe a little one. A medium-sized one, Eureka nodded surely, her hands on her hips. They all stared at her, so she elaborated further, with a warning sticker on it. Like that. Kaminari pointed at the wall. There was a yellow triangle there, with a warning, electric sign on it. Yellow. Like Team Yellow. Eureka knew the colors would be a good idea. Perfect, she grinned. You really are attracted to danger. Air, thanks. Eureka reached out for it, about to attempt prizing the cover off, but Shoji put a hand on her shoulder to hold her back. The warning sticker, he reminded her. She narrowed her eyes, pursing her lips as she thought, before clicking her fingers, and steering Kaminari in front of it. He shrugged, and with zero fear, just what Eureka liked to see, reached out for the box and pulled as hard as he could. Ah! Uh, it stuck. Sato cracked his knuckles behind him. Kaminari backed away, and Sato pulled the cover off with ease, no quirk required. I loosened it for you, Kaminari insisted as Eureka jumped in front of him, rubbing her hands together eagerly. She saw a bunch of wires and a few promising looking switches, okay. Now what? What do you mean now what? Kaminari repeated. I thought you were the expert. No. I usually just pull switches and see what happens, should we do that? Probably not right now, Shoji suggested. He had a few extra eyes and ears, so he could pay attention to their surroundings and the task at hand at the same time, get it? At hand. Super cool. Eureka wondered what it felt like to have so many eyes pointed in weird directions. How do we know this'll take out what we need though? Sato acknowledged. 
What if it only disables part of the building? Well, as long as it takes out principal Nisu systems, we're safe, right? Yurika replied. You're the expert, Kaminari sighed again. But she'd never pulled something off like this before. Sato took a few steps back, what if we made some more serious damage? If, on the night, we rip up some more wires and then electrocute it, it'll be harder to revert the damage. Flipping some switches is easily solved. Even I've repaired a broken fuse before, it's not hard, and we need to buy us as much time as possible. Great. So, what wires do we kill? Eureka asked him. I was thinking more, Sato turned, and everyone else followed his gaze. On the other side of the rooftop, was a much larger, metal structure, also sporting the beware, electrocution sign. Oh. Eureka bounced up and down, if you smashed that on the night, and then Kaminari went kaboom. Maybe we will take out the whole building. Kaminari raised a finger, air, question, why am I going kaboom? Eureka responded by making more sound effects. This extremely useful conversation, however, was interrupted by their lookout, who said exactly that, look out, I think someone's coming. Are you sure? Eureka whispered. A moment of silence, yes, positive. Eureka could hear it too now, the distant click clack of heels up stone stairs. She glanced around for escape routes on instinct. They were on a roof, it would be easy for her to escape with her gravity nullifying quirk, but could she manage all four of them? Her next move was to send out the predetermined, emergency SOS message to the group chat. Class 1 a group chat. 5 what homework is due on Monday? Luckily, it wasn't long before they received a reply. Pinky, the queen of the aliens. Don't worry. We'll help. We have to go, Shoji hissed. But where? Kaminari panicked. Eureka had no choice, they couldn't rely too heavily on the others pulling this off. Come on. She grabbed Kaminari's wrist, which immediately gave her a static shock, and the four of them hurried to the edge of the roof. Kaminari leaned over the edge, are you crazy? Possibly. She tapped each of them on the shoulder, activating her zero gravity quirk with a soft, pink glow. Just as the door to the roof swung open, Shoji had a hand around each of them, and pulled them off the edge and out of sight. He was holding onto the edge with his fingertips, keeping a firm grip on the others in case Eurika's power failed. And she was already starting to feel lightheaded. This was the moment a very loud bang was heard, and not too far below them, a great beam of light shot straight through the wall, sending rubble and debris plummeting to the ground below. They just stared in shock. Ciro poked his head out of the newly formed hole in Class A's homeroom. Oh, hey guys, he grinned. From his elbow, he sent a stream of white tape towards them, which Kaminari managed to grab. Shoji let go of the roof, and by the time whoever it was peered over the edge of the rooftop, they were already back inside the classroom. Eureka fell to the floor and deactivated her quirk with a queasy, release. Before clamping her hands over her mouth in a feeble attempt at stopping herself from throwing up. What the hell? Kaken yelled, for Eureka wasn't the only one clutching her stomach. Aoyama, on the other side of the room, had just fallen off his table and onto the floor. It must have been his laser that forged the hole. Well, that's one way of making a distraction, Midoriya gaped. Momo held out a hand to help Eureka to her feet, and gingerly escorted her back to her seat, patting her on the back and murmuring about missing the teas she had at home that would be so useful for this situation. Moments later, the door to the classroom was opened, which revealed Aitza, whose fleeting smile quickly faded. What did you do? He shouted at them all, gesturing to the giant hole in the classroom wall. Distractions. Mina replied, with jazz hands for extra effect. Aitza turned to Midoriya. Why didn't you stop them? Midoriya raised his hands in surrender, it happened way faster than I possibly could have anticipated. His gaze flickered to Tsu, who was supposed to be in charge of the disastrous Team Purple. Don't look at me. I had nothing to do with this, Ribbit. Hagakure walked in, whoa, she exclaimed. I don't know what I expected but this is way better. No it's not. Aitsa cried. Hagakure just patted him on the shoulder, pulled a sticky note from his pocket, and skipped over to hand it to Midoriya. Eureka, meanwhile, was still trying not to throw up. All in all, an average day at UA. Best distraction ever, Hagakure giggled. Of all time, added Mina.
Worst distraction, yelled Itza, and they all laughed. Eureka was feeling better by the time that they realized no teacher was coming to check on that noise. Hagakure mentioned it was because Itza told everyone in the staff room that it was probably support department shenanigans. Aoyama had a terrible stomach ache, and lay face down on his table for a while. Momo started making shiny things for him to make him feel better, like mini disco balls and sparkly Russian nesting dolls, a method that actually started to work. Eventually, English came to an end. The last lesson of the day was maths, held by Mr. Ectoplasm, a kind of freaky looking hero who could clone himself. But even he had a priceless look on his face when he opened the door to class A and came face to face with a gaping hole in the wall. Eighteen students blinked at him like nothing had happened, and the nineteenth was drooped over his desk in a small shrine of sparkly objects. Chapter 10, Who Are You To Me? Eureka skipped down the stairs that morning. She usually wasn't much of a morning person, but yesterday's excitement was still bubbling in her chest, and they still had a job to do. Morning, she called out cheerily to the group already gathered in the common room. I think you mean afternoon, Momo pointed out with a dainty laugh. Eureka glanced at the clock, it was just gone twelve. Huh. Maybe she still wasn't a morning person. Team Blue already left, Midori explained. He was sitting between Momo and Shoto, the table covered in various bits and pieces and Shoto was organizing and Momo was making copies of. What are you guys doing today? Siro asked Kaminari with a yawn. Trying to find where the power reaches school. Kaminari replied unsurely. Yep. Eureka exclaimed, popping the pee. Let me just brush my teeth and stuff, and she left to do just that, she'd have brunch later. They left the dorms as though they were just out for a walk, and not scouting the school for potential weaknesses in cybersecurity, if she could call it that. It helped that it was a Sunday. There were no lessons, and they didn't have to wear their uniforms. That meant that the red bands of class A weren't drawing the eyes of every passerby, which would mainly be hero students out for a jog. Fortunately enough, none of those hero students out and about were from class 1B, who would have recognized them regardless. Eureka supposed that the sky was looking rather gloomy. Some rain was on the way. That was probably why there were less out than usual, not that she would know what usual looked like, because class A rarely ventured outside the relative comfort of their dorms on Sundays. So, what are we looking for? Kaminari asked as they made their way across the grounds. Wherever the electric is, oh, there. Eureka exclaimed, bounding over to it. The entirety of UA was surrounded by a large, infamously impenetrable wall. But the segment they had stumbled upon was fence instead, lined with barbed wire. There were numerous yellow stickers and signs, warning of high voltage. Kaminari clapped his hands together with a wide smile. My kind of place. Is there a switch somewhere? Sato asked dully. Probably, Eureka nodded, but that's not good enough. We just need to turn the power off though, right? Be careful, Shoji suddenly interrupted. There are cameras here, there could be someone watching us. Right, Kaminari nodded. They started to back away, acting as casual as possible, it would be dangerous to target this location too, added Shoji. The voltage is much higher. I could take it. Not worth the risk. Well, well, well. If it isn't class A. The group turned, coming face to face with three rather familiar ones, well, one in particular. Out for a stroll. Manomo leered. The story of Team Blue. What the actual hell was he doing? He got thrown into this freaking school, in the wrong class, and he's never gonna get the hell out of it because of their freaking ex-convict teacher who seems to think that he needs to get along with D.E.K.U. And if you haven't realized yet, this is Bakugo, and he hasn't finished yet. Because if that wasn't irritating enough, he was shut in UA with Deku, who was the whole reason he was here. But why was Deku here? Well. It had taken a while for Bakugo to figure it out. The same seemed to go for Deku himself, weirdly enough. He thinks he's so freaking smart, but he couldn't even think of why he was here? Tsk, freaking typical. Deku was a useless nobody, no power, no future, no nothing. Bakugo may not have seen it at first, but he was glad someone else did. Because Deku was a villain, and that was why he needed to be here. The above still applied, obviously, just now he actually needed taking down if he did something. Bakugo saves the day, they finally realize that he didn't belong in class A, 
and those grins would be wiped right off the faces of those class B bastards. Only that's not what happened. Freaking Deku ended up somehow rallying class A together in some insane plot to be vigilantes and break out of UA. And Bakugo was just going along with it. What the hell was he doing? What was he doing? Deku's the villain, he's the problem. He's the... You seriously think you deserve to be a hero, when you act like this? Villain. Why are you walking so slow? Bakugo scowled at the earphone girl, with the edgy, purple hair and too much eyeliner. Shut up, he snarled, shoving his hands in the pockets of his baggy trousers. She rolled her eyes, is that what you say when you don't like a conversation, she said in a mocking voice. Shut up and shove off. Bakugo marched forwards to glare down at her, shut up and shove off. Guys, please, can't we all just get along, sighed weird hair. Freaking Kiri's Hima was the only tolerable idiot in this hellhole. He was here for vigilantism and spouted some noble rubbish about it when asked, saying stuff like he wanted to be like his hero idol, stop the bullies, one thing led to another and it got out of hand, the usual. Quite a lot of class A had done exactly the same thing, Bakugo had realized. Said something about society, huh? Bakugo frowned at his own thoughts. This place was getting in his head. Such tensions are no use to our mission, muttered Birdface, with the shadow quirk. Why the hell Bakugo had been lumped in a group with these imbeciles, was beyond him. Whatever, said Bakugo, turning away from earphones and marching on ahead. They were supposed to be looking for weak points in the wall around UA or something. Bakugo didn't care, he was still trying to figure out why he was following Deku's instructions. They walked in silence for a moment before earphones decided to speak up again. Hey, what's your problem with Midoriya, anyway? Bakugo glared daggers at her. What? We all know you hate each other. He said something about landing you in here himself. You a bully or something? What did Midoriya ever do to you? Has anyone ever told you that you're really freaking nosy? A few people, she shrugged. Why do you think I'm here? Kiri's Hima decided to step in again, seriously, guys, come on. We've talked about this. We don't need to pressure us anyone into explaining their past. We've all had our problems and... I don't have any problems. Bakugo yelled. It's Deku who has. Because you tormented him until he snapped. Earphones yelled. Bakugo stared at her. Why are you defending him? She snarled back at him, I just want to know you. I don't get you, I get everyone else, but not you. Nosy. Bakugo turned and kept walking. Why do you call him that, she asked. Bakugo ignored her. Deku? He calls you Kikin, and you call him Deku. I get the feeling your nicknaming skills don't have such as innocent origins. Bakugo stopped and turned on his heel. Deku means useless because that's what he is. A quirkless, useless, nobody. He kicked harshly at the ground, knocking pebbles aside that ricocheted against a tree trunk. Earphones crossed her arms, a quirkless, useless, nobody, who the hero seemed to think was dangerous enough to put in this class. I can see it. You're scared of him too. I'm not scared of D.E.K.U. You are. You so are, she grinned. You're scared because someone you thought was beneath you is suddenly more powerful than you. Because he's one of us and we're following his idea and his instructions, and you're scared enough to play along. Why would I be scared of him? She waited for a moment, as if she wanted him to think about what he just said, now you're asking the right questions. You've become a monster. Maybe that's something we have in common. Bakugo met her eyes for a moment, whilst Bird had checked out the portion of the wall they were standing by. I think you're just confused, she continued, a strange compassion adhering to her voice. Shut up, Bakugo snarled. She grinned. Shut up, and he pushed her. Kiri's Hima reached forwards to stop anything from escalating, but earphones held a hand up to him. I'm a good listener, she blinked at him. Why are you here, Bakugo? It was strange, hearing his actual name again from the mouth of someone that wasn't Kiri's Hima. He was so used to numbers or nicknames, so, dehumanizing. He felt like part of the system, shoved somewhere he didn't belong, told to make it work, when he'd led his whole life a different way. I'm not supposed to be here, Bakugo insisted, like he was telling himself that. Are you sure? Yes I'm freaking sure. I'm supposed to be in class B. 
he hit his hand against his chest with each proclamation. I'm supposed to be a freaking hero. I'm the top of the class, the best out there. I was going to be the best of them all. And now. He wavered. He didn't know how to answer that. Jiro put her hands on her hips, you feel like you've been lied to? Like you're nothing? Powerless. Useless. No. I I am not. You do realize you're no better than any of us, right? She took a step closer to him. There's no top of the pecking order, no best of the best. We're all powerless. It doesn't matter that Tokoyami could take this entire school down in the middle of the night, or that Kiri's Hima could take the bullets that Midoriya couldn't, or that you could blow a hole in the wall of class A, if you weren't too chicken. In the end, none of that matters. Because we all know that the one who's leading us has none of that. They all knew Midoriya had them wrapped around his pinky finger, even if he didn't quite see it himself. This vigilante thing. Earphones continued, it's crazy. It's so crazy, that it just might work. And maybe I want it to work. She prodded him in the chest, maybe you want it to work. Why would I want it to work, he hissed, staring at the ground. He felt so stupid, letting her talk to him like this. Why do you, she repeated. Exactly, I bet you've been asking yourself the same question, idiot. But I can see it clear as day. You want control again, control of your own future, and Yue can't give you that anymore. She sighed, blowing a piece of stray hair out of her eyes, everyone else gets why they're here. Everyone else wants to make something out of it. Only you are swimming against the current, trying to get back to the life you thought you should have had. Tough luck, that life is gone. Get with the times and look up to see where the hell you're going. She pushed him. He didn't stumble back nearly as much as she had. With that, she huffed, turned her nose up in the air and marched on ahead. Bakugo stared after her. The girl had guts, he'd give her that. She also may have just been promoted to the second most tolerable person in UA. Bakugo could see how that big mouth and nosy attitude could get her into trouble. She clearly didn't just know some secrets that she shouldn't, she must have made a fuss about them too. But whatever, for the first time since he got here, someone was finally speaking Bakugo's language. All right, earphones. She whipped around with fury in her eyes, either you call me Jiro, or I start calling you Kikin. Ignoring the worried looks of the other two, Bakugo started walking ahead beside Jiro. All right, Jiro, where do you think we're heading, huh? Oh, this whole vigilante thing? Yeah, we're all gonna get arrested. Bakugo almost laughed, then why the hell are we doing it? For fun, she shrugged. I don't know. I kind of want to see what happens. And being a semi-hero sounds pretty cool to me. Yeah? Well, I'll be a better freaking vigilante than you. You're right, you'll be caught way before me. Is that a challenge? Because I always win. Whoever wins shuts up and shoves off whenever the other says so. Freaking deal. Hey, guys, Kiri's Hima suddenly interjected, what's going on over there? The four of them stopped and looked to where Kiri's Hima was pointing. Just up ahead was another group of their classmates, with round face the gravity girl, the electric dunce and two other extras that Bakugo honestly didn't know the names of. Speaking to them, were three bastards from class B, headed by the king bastard, with the annoying copy quirk. Said copycat caught Bakugo's eye as he stormed over, ah, and more clowns joined the fray. The hell did you just call me? Bakugo snarled. What do you want, Manoma, asked Jiro, now standing by round face's side. Well just the way he said that made Bakugo want to punch him in the gob, I couldn't help but notice a few strange happenings recently. Right after one of your fellow, um, classmates, was failed after essentially letting an army of villains into the school, and almost getting one of my friends killed. Now, it's not hard to miss the giant hole in your classroom wall, and then I see a strange group of you wander out of the dorms, soon followed by a second, do you see my thought process here? Well, Suburba, Sen and I, decided we, the heroes, would check it out. Wouldn't want you letting any more of your kind into UA, now would we? Your kind. Bakugo gritted his teeth, knowing from the way that copycat leered at him, that he knew he'd hit a nerve. Not long ago, Bakugo would have retaliated by stepping away from his classmates, yelling about how he wasn't one of them, he wasn't a villain, he wasn't part of this. But now. Now, he didn't know for sure. 
and strangely enough, it was in this moment that Bakugo recalled the words of Mr. Izawa, back on the very first day of term. You will graduate when I believe you understand why you ended up here, and when you can see a better path to the future. So, why was he here? You're the villain, look at what you're doing. And Bakugo grinned. He took a step forwards and dared to look that hero scum right in the eyes as he said, Our kind, huh? Bet you like trying to beat us down, call us names, makes you feel better about yourself. You know why? Because I've been there. I'm the best of the best. I'd wipe the floor with any of you losers and don't you forget it. But I'm here because I wasn't acting like a freaking hero, and I got labeled as a villain. Well, who's the villain now, huh? Because it sure isn't any of us. Look at what you're doing and think for a second. If that's even possible in your case, Leech. Said Leech blinked, whatever he was expecting Bakugo to say, the reality was far from his estimation. What did you just call me? Bakugo jabbed him harshly in the chest, like a certain someone had just done to him, as he said, I called you a leech, because that's what you freaking are. Someone who sucks up to the heroes and prances around in a fancy dress rental like it's a freaking catwalk. Someone who leeches off other people's powers because you don't have a real one of your own. Do ya, copycat. One of the extras stood in between Bakugo and their leader, hey, back off, hypocrite. Does trying to beat us down and call us names make you feel better about yourself? Bakugo crossed his arms, maybe it did a little. Two steps forward and one step back, Jiro huffed behind him. At least you're going somewhat in the right direction. What the hell does that mean? Carries him aside, look, guys, we don't need this to escalate any further. Let's just all go our separate ways, this doesn't need to end with any more conflict. You still haven't answered our question, added the second extra. What are you doing out here? Next to the power supply. Right, yeah, that. You were the one who ambushed us. Dunn's face exclaimed, electricity sparking at his fingertips. There was a sudden clap of thunder overhead, which made Jiro screech and round face jump several feet into the air. That wasn't me, the idiot, you know which one, decided to remind them. Bakugo stared at him, yeah, no sh. We should all head back to the dorms, Kiri's Hima interjected nervously, glancing up at the storm clouds. I agree, Birdhead nodded, I do not appreciate the sudden darkness of this day. Alright. The bird was the first to move, eager to get back to the Light of Heights Alliance, but Leech reached out to grab him by the arm and stop him in his tracks. We're not done here, he hissed, and Bakugo knew those words he'd spat at the copycat must have made their mark. What is almost half of Class A doing out, halfway across the school, by the mains power supply on a Sunday afternoon? Six arms came to Birdhead's aid and pushed the leech away, towering over him menacingly with one set of arms crossed, and the other four held ready to deck him. This is all just a big misunderstanding. Round face tried. We're all here by coincidence, honest. Like I'd believe you, hissed one of the sidekicks as the rain started to pitter-patter down on their heads. Hey. Jiro snapped, that's not on. Leave her alone she didn't do anything. You're just making this worse. Kiri's Hima exclaimed, just let us go. Stop trying to play hero in situations that you don't belong in. Trust me when I say it'll only make things worse. And that's the difference between us and you, the extra continued. Leech picked up where he'd left off, we'll be real heroes and this is our school, which we are protecting from the likes of you. Tell us the truth of why you're here, and I won't have to test your friend's quirk against you. All eyes flickered between Birdhead and the copycat. No, 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 you don't know what you're doing. Kiri's Hima exclaimed, and now it was Bakugo's turn to stop him from running any closer. Tokoyama's quirk is dangerous you can't use it. Round face added as they all started to back away. Not in this storm. At those words, the rain seemed to grow heavier, or maybe Bakugo was only now really noticing it. And it was dark. Not once during their time at UA, had Birdhead's quirk grown wild. Even at the USJ, he'd somehow kept it under control. Perhaps he was a little better at it than implied by the stupid warning signs pinned up next to every single light switch in the dorms. But Copycat had none of his experience. That smile of his returned, now he believed he had the upper hand. But if the quirk gained strength in darkness, it must have been weaker in the light. And that was where Bakugo had the advantage. Tell us the truth, he insisted, holding out a hand that a dark, 
oozing shadow began to wrap itself around. You can't threaten us. Jiro barked. Besides, we weren't doing anything. Listen to you Erika. Maybe I should call Mr. Izawa, Kiri's Hima whispered to them. No, Bakugo hissed in reply, it's freaking fine, leave it to me. Leering from the back of his high horse, Leech dared to release the quirk, and from behind him, stepped a perfect copy of himself, colored a deep, black purple, with gleaming gold eyes, eerily similar to that warp villain from the USJ. Except this dark shadow was just that, shadow, rather than the fog that billowed around the teleporting bastard. Nice, very nice, said the leech, examining the shadow that blinked back at him. Bakugo noted round face messaging someone on her brick phone, the only reason Bakugo hadn't blown his up already was because it was freaking impossible, and this could mean only one thing, Dry Eyes was on his way and Bakugo would rather fail Class A than be stuck in detention cleaning Class B's plates for a second time. Okay, maybe that was a bit of an exaggeration, but Class B was so freaking annoying. How did Mr. Izawa manage to make Bakugo fear being in detention more than expelled? It was like making a dog fear being called bad more than going to the kennels. His teaching method could only be compared to freaking puppy training. Hell, even the number system fitted in. What was this school? Whatever, he now had the chance to beat someone up, and with a quirk which had a fundamental weakness to light. Perfect. Bring it on. Bakugo snarled, shifting into a fighting chance, palms cupped, ready to summon his fire power. But then he felt the water trickle down his forehead, and quickly realized that despite the blatant disadvantages of the shadow quirk, Bakugo's own power had more immediate problem, rain. His nitrogenous sweat was suddenly diluted and now utterly useless. The rain was growing heavier by the second and he couldn't even ignite his explosions. Shoot. He shouldn't have spoken out so quickly. Luckily, he can't believe he's considering this lucky, Kiri's Hima slid in between them again, hardening his skin with his unbreakable ability. Stop. Deactivate the power, we don't want a fight, you don't know this quirk. Copycat let out a slight laugh as he raised both hands in mock surrender, okay, okay, I know I intimidate you, but there's no need to be scared. All I ask is that you tell us the truth of why you're here, that is all. I'm not freaking scared of you. Bakugo yelled, Kiri's Hima holding out an arm to stop him from coming closer, but there was no need. Without warning, the shadow launched, its arms now blade-like as he slammed into Kiri's Hima, who managed to protect Bakugo, but only just. Manoma, calm down, called out one of the extras, who was just as shocked as everyone else. That wasn't me. Copycat insisted. His shadow was still seemingly attached to his feet, hovering before him with a sadistic grin, growing larger as the storm grew stronger. Stop it, he called out to the shadow, but it didn't listen to him. With learned reflexes, Kiri's Hima ducked and rolled out of the way when the shadow struck again. By this point, Bakugo had backed under the shelter of a tree, trying the best he could to dry off his hands. How do you control this quirk, the idiot who copied it yelled. Years of training and discipline, Birdhead muttered, gawking at the looming shadow. And even then, we were deemed dangerous enough to fall into UA's program. You can't simply control Dark Shadow, it has a mind of its own. You are nothing but its host. The shadow had been listening. It stopped attacking Kiri's Hima, now blinking at the bird as it mulled his words over. Then send your shadow to attack that one, the other extra ordered. And risk having two on the loose. Sparky cried. Are you crazy? Turn it off, Manoma, yelled Kiri's Hima. Sen, let me copy your quirk to cancel this one out, said Copycat, lunging for his friend. But the shadow wasn't having any of it. It darted back to its host to try and stop him, but not before the two hero students had managed to brush fingertips with each other. Bakugo thought that was that then, he'd been furiously trying to wipe the water off his hands with the underside of his shirt for nothing, but no matter, because Leech's plan didn't seem to work. The shadow flickered in and out of existence, like he was trying to turn the quirk off and replace it with the extra's ability, but the sentient power was turning itself back on. He was now wrestling with it on the floor, as it engulfed him completely, trying to cover his whole body and take control, like a parasite on the leech. Bakugo let out a cry of frustration, we need light, that'll kill the shadow. Hey, hero sidekicks. Do you have your freaking phones? They didn't even bother taking offense, and one scrambled to their back pocket to bring out their phone and activate the flashlight. 
This idea was good for roughly a second, before the shadow lashed out and the phone soon lay by a nearby tree, smashed to pieces. Sparky, make us some light with your quirk. Bakugo tried. What, he exclaimed, no way. It's soaking wet and I haven't used my power for a couple of days. I could fry everyone here and the school's power source. With no other ideas, there was only one more thing left to ask, how long does the copycat quirk last? Bakugo barked at whoever might know the answer. Five minutes, said one of his goons, the one not mourning the loss of his phone. If it weren't for the fact that it was far from the heroic thing to do, Bakugo was up for just leaving him there until his quirk wore off. Served him right for picking a fight with the wrong people. And of course, this would be the perfect moment for Mr. Izawa to skid around the corner and cancel the quirk out. But no. Because Roundface didn't contact Mr. Izawa, she decided to message. Midoriya, exclaimed most of the group when he appeared from the gloom of the trees. Bakugo was ready to die. Anyone but Deku. It could have been literally anyone but Deku. But of course round face message D.E.K.U. Deku stood and stared at the sight before him, a shocked look across his dumb face. Monoma copied Tokoyama's quirk and it went wild. Kiri's Hima explained. 18, yelled one of the hero extras, hey, they look too similar for Bakugo to bother separating the two. You've gotta take his quirk. Take his. You mean Honoki didn't Deku started before his eyes widened with some kind of realization. He gritted his teeth, are right. And like a freaking martyr, Deku charged forwards at the raging shadow, that had already given Kiri's Hima a fight and had easily destroyed the extra's phone with one movement, not that that's particularly hard to do. If it were one of the brick phones, Bakugo would have been more impressed. There was a higher chance than usual that Deku could have finally bit the dust, but whatever god was really out there, decided that the idiot still hadn't completed his purpose of driving Bakugo utterly insane. Perhaps Bakugo could have described this more heroically, but he's not going to, because he hates Deku's guts and this was Bakugo's story, after all. So, maybe there was a little bit of screaming, some mild injury and perhaps a touching moment when the hero took the hand of the villain and it suddenly became incredibly unclear which way around it was meant to be. Regardless, there were now two idiots lying in a puddle of mud in the middle of a storm, one looking scared out of his mind and the other with a new gash to add to his never freaking ending collection, Bakugo ignored the fact that said collection was mostly his fault. The extras helped the freed leech to his feet, whilst Kiri's Hima came to Deku's aid. They all surrounded him asking stupid questions like, are you okay, and other sappy remarks hailing his bravery that Bakugo didn't pay any attention to. What were you thinking? Deku yelled at copycat as the latter caught his breath. His two goons were still helping him to stand. You could have seriously hurt yourself and everyone here. Copycat pulled an arm away from one of the extras and pointed at him, mouthing something whilst he struggled to get the words out, until he finally managed, why you, you give me, give me my quirk back. Deku scowled and crossed his arms, maybe you can't be trusted with it. The only reason Bakugo was going along with this was because it scared the wits out of Copycat, and not because it gave Deku any sort of power. You threatened my friends, copied a dangerous ability that you had no knowledge of, and then when everyone told you to stop, you kept going. Deku continued to yell, his voice cracking at the end in obvious frustration. The bastard used to be so meek and irritating. Now he was abrasive, opinionated, and even more annoying. Eureka said you confronted them, said that you thought they were up to something. Why? You should have just told a teacher if you thought something was wrong. Everyone being here together is a coincidence, and the two groups were clearly just having separate, civilized conversations and then you just swooped in. Well, what can I say? You heroes are always so quick to start a fight, he snapped, spitting words like venom. I've told you before and I'll say it again. We don't want to be here. But we are, tough luck. This is our school as much as it is yours, whether you like it, or we like it, or not. Silence fell over them all for a while, finally broken by a bright flash of lightning, and the rumble of thunder that soon followed. We need to get back to the dorms, Deku sighed. Are you okay, Tokoyami? Dark Shadow is currently secure, yes, the bird nodded. Although I agree, we should not stay out here for any longer than necessary. Maybe you should go to Recovery Girl for that cut, Midori, round face fussed over him. I'm fine, Deku insisted. He had a large cut across his cheek, running from just below his mouth, up to the top of his right ear. 
a freaking stupid volume of blood oozed from it, quickly washed away by the rain. Just give him his quirk back, man, sighed one of the sidekicks, whilst the other retrieved his broken phone. Deku turned and glared at them whilst the rest of the group began to make their leave, you can have it in five minutes. And before they could complain, Deku started to walk away, saying, safest to leave it for a while to make sure you don't still have Tokoyama's quirk when it comes back. They didn't say another word against it, and Class A disappeared into the trees, leaving the other three behind. Oh, and Bakugo, who had simply been watching the entire ordeal, catching Deku's eyes once or twice whilst the events unfolded. What do you want, snapped Minoma, rage dripping from his expression. Bakugo shoved his hands in his pockets and turned away. Are you proud of being with that psychopath, huh? Copycat shouted after him, held back, and up, by the sidekicks. You will always be villains. You'll never wash it away. Class A will follow you for the rest of your life and there's nothing you can do about it. You can yell all you want about being better than us, but when it comes down to it, you will never make the cut. Bakugo simply ignored him and stomped off, refusing to meet the eyes of his reflections in the growing puddles around him. He stopped before Heights Alliance, the happy-go-lucky name of Class A's prison-like dorm building, and he gazed up at the sky. Fat raindrops came drip-dropping down. Such a simple force could wash away everything that made him powerful. He looked back at the dorms, and at the warm light flowing out from them. Bakugo could just see their silhouettes as they probably fawned over Deku, shoving a plaster on his face. There were a million other things Bakugo could have thought of, standing outside in the cold and rain, but Bakugo wasn't the one to dwell on such things. He walked back inside and went for a shower. The story of Team Green. Shoto didn't know exactly what he was doing in this group. Across Saturday and Sunday, Midoriya and Yeyorozu had been hard at work, poking and prodding at Mineta's old phone, and muttering about the mechanisms that made it up. Shoto had no hope in understanding what they were doing. He saw lots and lots of tiny little pieces with immense detail, all held together on a slab of plastic, perhaps ironically, colored green. Shoto moved the pieces around on the table, keeping them neat and organized because that was all he could think of to do. Although Yeyorozu tried her best to copy it and create a new phone, she concluded that she simply couldn't produce a working model without months and months of practice, and extensive research on the topic. This was something that, without internet or access to any books, if they asked, it would be suspicious, and they doubted there would be such a specific book hidden somewhere in the library, that seemed an impossible feat to complete in the span of two days. Instead, they began work of resetting Mineta's phone. They'd lost a lot of time from experimenting with the first idea, but it didn't seem like they needed nearly as much to complete their second task. Shoto would describe what they did, but he had no idea whatsoever. He hovered around the two, feeling a little stupid whilst he picked up on the occasional word that made sense, but not in the sentence that they was used in. When Shoto dared to ask what was going on, the two seemed very supportive and tried their best to explain, but dumbed it down to such a level that Shoto felt ashamed for not understanding after three attempts, and so began blindly nodding despite knowing nothing. Look, Shoto may have often been called a bright kid, but he wasn't exactly the smartest in the class. Two years off the grid hadn't done any good to his education. How he wasn't bottom of the class, was beyond him, especially since he didn't bother trying at all in the first week or so. Perhaps Shoto was just a lookout, Midoriya did say they needed one per group. But Shoto didn't know what he was looking out for. They never dared to tinker with the phones in plain sight of any of the teachers, and therefore left all of their work at the dorms. Mr. Izawa was still badly hurt from the USJ incident and spent far less time watching over them like a hawk from the corner of the common room, leaving them free to do what they wanted. There were no cameras inside the dorms, perhaps because this would be considered an invasion of privacy, or maybe because they had never been given a reason to do so before. Shoto could also definitely see previous year groups destroying the cameras the moment they were given the chance, and Yue would have soon given up on replacing them. Not that they didn't have the budget to, Yue was well known for having far more money available than they probably should. Shoto heard rumor that this was mainly down to a combination of revenue from the sports festival, as well as a certain mouse-like principal with an intelligence quirk, who had a way with the stock market. Okay, moment of truth, Midoriya muttered as the phone, now reassembled, slowly turned back on. He and Yeyorozu high-fived when several previously hidden options reappeared on the screen. Are we just going to do the same to the other phones now? Shoto questioned. 
he probably shouldn't have used the word we since he had nothing to do with this. Not quite yet. Midoriya replied, grinning from ear to ear at his accomplishment. First we need to make sure that what we've done to this phone won't be picked up by any kind of sensor. And more importantly, whether the teachers can read messages sent by this phone or not. Yeyorozu turned on her own phone to compare the two screens. Hmm, perhaps all the groups set up here, including the individuals, for example, messages between numbers 20 and 18, are in fact group chats, and the teachers are included, but hidden from sight. Midoriya nodded slowly, right, and we have no way of making new group chats or editing the groups. So, he picked up Mineta's phone again and started making his way through the settings. Okay, yes. Yes, look, Mineta sent a couple of messages to Kaminari a while back, and see. Oh, it is a group. Yeah, Mr. Iza was in there, and Midnight, and I'm guessing that's Principal Nizu's contact. Shoto just blinked and leaned over their shoulders whilst they experimented messaging Midoriya's brick phone with some mockingly angry messages from Mineta's. If one of the teachers were somehow able to read them, they wouldn't be suspicious that they had Mineta's phone, since the messages seemingly came from him. They were extremely pleased when the message was received on Midoriya's phone, from the contact named 19, except in a different chat location, Shoto didn't know what he was talking about, to, where it was before? Oh well, they seemed happy about the result, so, Shoto was too. Well, do you think it's safe to tamper with the other phones now? Yeyorozu asked Midoriya. He hesitated, yes, yes, I think it is. To be honest, I'm still surprised we didn't just wipe all the data off Mineta's phone. Me too. I thought it would just result in a factory reset. You're quite proficient with technology, Midoriya. T thanks. You can reset my phone next if you want, Shoto offered. He needed to give some input somehow. Are you sure, replied Midoriya. Shoto simply nodded and slid it over. The two of them were far quicker at the process a second time around, even though there was one small slip up, and they feared they'd accidentally broken it or something. Regardless, not long after, Shoto was handed his phone back, now fully operational. I guess mine should be next. Midoriya supposed. Yeyorosa shook her head, perhaps leave yours a little longer. Just in case yours has extra security on it. Mr. Izawa was quite aware of your ability to tamper with these phones. Alright, good point. Um, yours then. Okay, but would you like some tea before we... Shoto, I wouldn't if I were you. Yeyorosa stopped, blinking at Midoriya's words before turning her head to Shoto to see what he was doing. Shoto blinked too, and the phone on his lap blinked back at him, the black cursor against a white screen, waiting for a number to be dialed in. Midoriya barely looked up from Yeyorosa's phone, which he'd already started taking apart with the various sized screwdrivers she'd made for the task. What would you even say? Shoto faltered. What, was he doing? Who would he call? Who would he speak? Dabby. He, wanted to speak to Dabby. He was the only family he could rely on, right? He'd taken him away from father, away from that danger. He was safety, he knew the truth behind Endeavor and the poison that was this country's heroic system. When Shoto finally got out of UA, Dabby would be there for him. Right? But what would he say? Hey, Dabby, why did you leave me behind? Why did you never come to rescue me? You did the first time, you got me away from father. Why didn't you do it a second time? Why did you leave me to his grasp, to UA's? This place was messing with his head. Shoto didn't know right from wrong anymore, and he had been so sure. He existed to take up his father's mantle and become a heartless hero like him. But Shoto had taken control of his own destiny when he went with Dabi, who had done the same. He was going to shake the foundations of this society and become anything but a hero, he'd make Endeavor regret what he did to his mother. But he was thrown into UA, he'd been through so much in such a short space of time and met so many weird and wonderful people. And now, what was he doing? Thinking of leaving UA not to return to Dabi, but to become, a vigilante? He didn't, he didn't like what Dabi was. Shoto had seen too many horrors at his brother's hands and he, didn't want to be a part of that, he never did, he just, didn't feel like he had much of a choice. It was hero, or villain, black and white, wrong or right, no in between. But then these people turn around and say that he can be both, and that they'd be there too. 
Now Shoto wasn't sure at all. He often looked in the mirror and saw two halves never meant to be whole. He brushed his white hair to cover his red side and hide the scar from view. He tried to banish his father from his life, completely erase him. For Shoto had two quirks, his mother's ice, and his father's fire, forced together. But he refused to use the fire. Never. He would not utilize Endeavor's power, he didn't need it. He took one look at what it did to Davi and it, it scared him. I'm going to take the silence as a, I don't know, Midoriya continued. Shoto looked up for a moment to see him well into the process of fixing the phone. Why you need to stop looking at yourself as the son of Endeavor, he said. Shoto's head snapped up. He could feel the fire burning beneath his skin, he pushed it down. What? Well, that fact just seems to rule your life, Midoriya sighed. At this point Yeyorozu awkwardly stood up and shuffled past. She picked up the empty pot of tea and scurried over to the kitchen to refill it. It does not, Shoto snapped. It does. Tell me one thing that you've done, ever, that wasn't a direct consequence of your dad. He hesitated. What did that even mean? Realizing Shoto didn't quite understand, Midoriya added, for example, you didn't try at all at the beginning of term because you didn't want to show Endeavor that you cared. You, left with Dabi because you wanted to get away from him. You fought heroes on the streets to stay away from him. You agreed to take part in this vigilante thing to spite him. Anything else? Shoto simply stared, mouth slightly agape. Midoriya finally looked up for a moment, have you ever done anything because you wanted to, and your dad wasn't even part of the equation? I, I. And then there was silence again, for a good two minutes at least. Yeyorosa didn't reappear in the meantime, and Shoto could just hear her chatting with Mina out of sight. I helped you at the USJ, Shoto finally answered. Midoriya stopped fiddling with the phone. I stayed, and I helped you get to Mr. Izawa, or whatever you were doing, he shrugged. Endeavor had nothing to do with that. Midoriya nodded, T thank you. You've already said this. I know, but, thank you. You gave up your chance to escape to help. 4. F for just a moment, you forgot about him, E Endeavor, that is. Shoto's eyes drifted back to his phone. It still waited patiently for the phone number. Still staring at it, Shoto continued, but I was thinking about him, he realized. How come? My, my quirk, I never use my fire. Because you think it's your father's, right? Yeah, you only ever use your eyes. I knew you could use both. Shoto frowned, what do you mean, think it's father's? Midoriya shrugged poking at Yeyorozu's phone again. Well, it's not, is it? Do you think my lack of a power belongs to the distant relatives that I kind of inherited it from? Um, no. Exactly. A any power I may or may not have, belongs to me, and no one else. All of Tsu's family have frog-like quirks. Does her quirk belong to them? I... No. No, it doesn't. You've got a dual ability, Shoto, and that's amazing. But it's not two separate powers, one from your mum and one from your dad. It's one quirk, you've inherited a combination and you're just not using half of it. Like, air, you use both eyes. Even if one looks like what your mums probably do and the other from your dad. Actually, you kind of cover half your face so maybe that wasn't the best example. Shoto just watched him attack the phone with tweezers and a small metal toothpick whilst he mumbled. You need to stop approaching situations and thinking, oh, what would Endeavor want me to do here, and then doing the opposite. Just do whatever's best for you, whether he'd be happy with that decision or not. S so, stop doing everything to spite him, and start doing it despite him. Shoto picked up his own phone again and glared at the blank screen, mulling the words over in his mind. Um, and that goes for Dabi too, Midoriya suddenly added. You try to act like you don't care about what anyone thinks, but you do, a lot. Does this make any sense? I've been told that I kind of spew loads of words at people when they actually stop to listen to me and they hardly ever make sense so if you don't want to listen then I completely understand should I just stop talking now? Shoto smiled. He turned off his phone and put it face down on the table. You make sense to me. Midoriya blinked at him for a moment and then visibly relaxed, oh, okay, good. Just tell me to shut up if I... The conversation was cut short by the prompt beep from Midoriya's phone. 
Shoto was a little worried that they'd been caught tampering with them for a moment, before he glanced over his friend's shoulder and spied a message from Eureka. Eureka-18 help. We were just out for a walk and Monoma confronted us. He thinks we're up to something. We're by the power source to the school, not far from the dorms. He's copied Tokoyama's quirk and it's getting dark. Midoriya bolted upright upon finishing the message. He shoved his phone in his pocket and charged towards the door. Do you want me to come with you? Shoto offered, startled by the suddenness of the development as he stood up too. No. That could just make things worse. Midoriya retorted, pulling on his bright red shoes in a hurry. Wait for me to come back before you do anything more with the phones. And with that, he disappeared. Yeyorozu walked back over to Shoto, glancing between the unfinished phone, the empty seat, and the door that had just slammed shut behind Midoriya. Um, where did he go? Shoto shrugged, to yell at someone. Oh, okay. Um, would you, like some tea? Yes please. Alright, that's where we'll leave off for the day. Thanks so much for listening along with me today. If you enjoyed please like and comment down below. It really helps with the algorithms. I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now, lovelies.